Karl Marx stated that France was the country where the class struggle is always fought out to the end. That's very true and corresponds closely to what I observed a long time ago, too long that I would care to remember. 50 years ago, just imagine that. Half a century has passed since those grandiose events of the class struggle in France. And yet in my memory, in my mind, th th these memories remain as fresh as if these things occurred yesterday. It was an absolutely tremendous, marvelous example of what? In the first instance of the enormous power in the hands of our class, the working class. Some people forget this, some people never knew it. But it's 2968 also. Actually, I gave a talk on this same subject in, in rather bad French in the, University of Quebec, in the University of Quebec a few years ago. And there was an idiot there that, uh, an idiot university professor, 99% of university professors in my experience are complete idiots. <laughs> you know, I, I have a personal experience of it, you know. And uh, this man who uh, said he was there, I don't doubt physically he was there. Where he was psychologically, I would have to ask a, a qualified psychiatrist. I wouldn't know. But anyway, he was there and he said, oh, no, I, but when I said that it was an enormous movement of the working class, he said, oh, no, 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 it was all to do with the students who wanted to get into the girls' dormitories in Nanterre. I asked him at the end, oh, by the way, uh, did you ever get into the girls' dormitory? <laughs> It is, of course, this, this is a complete trivialized, a typical middle class, ignorant, petty bourgeois trivialization of a great historical uh, event. This, as, uh, as the chairman just pointed out, this was the biggest revolutionary general strike in the whole of history. History knows nothing comparable to this. And it came, comrades and friends, like a thunderbolt from a clear blue sky. This earthquake of the class struggle was not foreseen by anybody, not even ourselves, although in principle we, we, we understood it, which others did not. But others, most of the others, denied it, as they do today, to this very day, as the, happened in Quebec in that unfortunate discussion, where yet again these idiots, these morons, who infest the universities, I've come to the conclusion that uh, some of the most ignorant people in society are to be found in the, between the four walls of a university, and I'm not referring to the students necessarily. But these ideas, oh, you know, the working class doesn't exist. Did you know that, Ben? <laughs> you, you noticed? The working class doesn't exist. I'm informed by these intellectuals. Let us after their name. Yes. Uh, there was a young worker comrade of ours from Quebec who stood up, I was pleased to say, in the, in the course of the discussion, he said, well, comrade, you said in French, I am fed up of attending meetings where I'm informed that I do not exist. <laughs> I said, well, look, you, you, working class doesn't exist. But of course, we, we are sitting in this wonderful auditorium, the, the, the speakers are working, the light, is, uh, the light is shining, by the way. Who's responsible for that? Is it an act of God that the light is shining on us? I think the working class has got something to do with that. And of course, it, it, it remains a fact, whether you like it or not, it remains a fact. That in all countries in the world, not a light bulb signs, not a telephone rings, not a wheel turns without the kind permission of the working class. You better remember that. That the working class has got colossal power in its hands. And this was precisely revealed very clearly in 1968. And yet you had these fools, including fools that call themselves Marxists. There are quite a few, quite a few of them also Marxists, even Trotskyists. Oh yes, oh yeah, who failed to understand this completely. You see, the fact of the matter is, to a certain extent, one could understand it at that time. To a certain extent, 
I had a conversation with a couple of Italian comrades that are staying in my house, young comrades, and I was explaining the kind of situation I remember when I was their age about a million years ago. Well, not, not, as, long, uh, not, not as long ago as that, in the 1960s precisely. In Britain, in France, in Germany, you had full employment. Oh yes. There was no unemployment. The only time you were unemployed was when you changed your job, basically. And you left school, you left university, you walked, in, you walked into a job of your choice. There was free education in Britain. You didn't have to pay. I didn't pay. I'm from a poor working class family. I didn't pay a bean for, for eight years. And I went to quite a, a posh university at that time. Uh, eight years. I never paid a bean. I was paid a living wage because of the gains won by the working class. Nobody ever gives us anything. The ruling class never gives anything away. As a, as a result of decades of struggle, of class struggle, which won these enormous achievements. Of course, at that time, the capitalists could afford it because there was a colossal upswing. That's the point I wanted to make. A colossal upswing of the productive forces after the end of the Second World War, which lasted until 1973-74. That was the first international uh, recession. And this enormous, of course, this enormous uh, upswing in capitalism undoubtedly caused problems for the revolutionaries. It caused problems for us. We were isolated for the whole historical period. Ted Grant, the forces that supported him, myself included, Rob also, we were isolated. Because, the, you see, when we argued in favor of revolution and capitalism doesn't work and so on, people just looked at you uh, rather strangely. And that was the case uh, also in France. And of course, the, 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 the ignorant sectarians, the people who could, could, the smart intellectual academic Marxists, how I hate that expression. Academic Marxist. What the hell is an academic Marxist? I would like to know. It's not in the Oxford Dictionary. You cannot be an academic Marxist. Either you're, either you're a revolutionary Marxist or you're nothing. These people, of course, were nothing. Let me give you, let me give you a quote from one of these academic Marxists. He was quite a well-known intellectual of the period. By the name of André Gortz, who wrote the following. Get a load of this. Write it down. Don't forget these words. These, they're priceless. In the foreseeable future... There will be no crisis of European capitalism so dramatic as to drive the mass of workers to revolutionary general strikes or armed insurrections in support of their vital interests. This, these pearls of wisdom were published during the biggest revolutionary general strike in history. I wonder that the, the, the chap didn't die of shame. But these people don't have any shame. They simply don't have any sense. Uh, and the reason, the reason I'm under, underlining this point is that uh, they haven't learned. They say the same things now. Yeah, oh, yes. Uh, many of these so-called university mar intellectual Marxists deny the role of the working class. Or the workers are bought off. Oh, I'll give you another example. The great Ernest Mandel. You may have heard of him. Have you? Yes. Hands up those who've heard of Ernest Mandel. Right, you can forget him now. <laughs> he's, he's not worth remembering. <laughs> he was no good. I know you shouldn't speak ill of the dead, but he was no good then, and he's even worse now. <laughs> Ernest Mandel, this great so-called Marxist, came to London. I remember, I was there. In the, I think it was January 1968. He, was, he spoke for about an hour, and he spoke about all kinds of things. The, Negro struggle in America, women's lib, gay lib, uh, uh, the Vietnam War, uh, Che Guevara, Mao Zedong, you name it. Anything and everything except for the French working class. And this man was living in Paris. So one of our comrades asked him a question. Comrade Mandel, you've spoken for an hour and you haven't mentioned the working class once. You know what he said? The words are engraved on my memory. The French working class, you can forget about the French working class. They are bourgeoisified, they are Americanized, and uh, you can forget about any movement of the French workers for the next 20 years. This is in January 1968. <laughs> so Mr. Andre Gortz was not alone in his intellectual wonderland. Yes, but you see, it was true. There was no empirical, there was nothing to suggest that such a movement could take place in France. The French working class, in, in fact, had not moved for quite a long time. There were strikes, some strikes. There were symptoms, if 
people were past me road every ten minutes going up, old chap. Yeah, I just passed you on. For ten did you? I didn't see it. You didn't. <laughs> I'd ignore that. <laughs> uh, that there was no real movement, and therefore, of course, they looked elsewhere. They looked somewhere else. They had other professors like Marcus. Marcus, that horrible wretch. He uh, Marcus. Uh, you know, uh, uh, they showed, in fact, they showed a contempt for the working class. Absolute contempt. No understanding, because they had no contact with the real, real world of the workers. And therefore, they looked for some other point of support. Uh, the peasants in backward countries, a guerrilla war, a Mao Zedong, a Che Guevara, all this stuff. Oh, and the students, of course, the students. Students were okay, the intellectuals and so on. That was the basis, not the working class. You see, now you, they could be, to some extent, excused. What, what they, uh, they, no, they could not be excused. I take that back. You see, the point is this. What this shows is that these ladies and gentlemen had not an atom of understanding of dialectics. You cannot understand the French Revolution in 1968 without understanding dialectics. These people were empirics. They basically says on the facts. You know the facts. Let's see the facts. What's the facts? The fact is the workers have not strike non strikers. Yes, that may be perfectly true. Yes. That's empiricism. But empiricism is very narrow and very superficial. It doesn't get you very far. Dialectics doesn't just base itself on the facts, the things you see in front of yourself. It penetrates beneath the surface of what is to demonstrate the internal contradictions and tensions within society which, are, which build up and build up over a long period of time until they reach a, cri a critical point where a qualitative change takes place, an explosion. That's called a revolution in everyday uh, language. Trotsky had a really wonderful, remarkable, brilliant way of expressing this, uh, this fact. He referred to the molecular process of socialist revolution. You should all Bear that in mind, that marvelous phrase. The molecular process of socialist rev revolution is precisely that beneath the surface, and that goes for Britain today, as Comrade Martin just uh, po pointed out, it, beneath the surface of apparent calm, apparent uh, immobility, there's a seething discontent, indignation, rage, Frustration, more, more than anything else, which is trying to find a way out. It's like the uh, uh, invisible forces beneath our feet. In geology, this seething mass of molten rock moving at unimaginable temperatures and speeds, quite invisible to the naked eye until it explodes with an elemental force. And that, my friends, is precisely what occurred in May 1968. Now, the general uh, run of people imagine, they think that there's a kind of mythology, that, oh yes, it was all started by the students. Now, to some extent, that is true. Only to some extent, you see. One could argue, and you, you wouldn't be wrong on that, that the students could have act acted as a kind of catalyst. Yes, but a catalyst can only take effect when the, when the conditions are there. If the conditions are not there prepared in advance, then you can do what you like. You'll have no effect whatsoever. But it's true, there was a ferment among the students. Not just in France, it was an international phenomenon. You had it in Northern Ireland. You had it in America in particular. The Vietnam War was a, a huge uh, issue. In, in Britain also, which I lived through that also. Mass demonstrations and so on. In France there were such, throughout 1967 there were big demonstrations protesting mainly about foreign affairs, about, about the uh, the against the Vietnam War in particular, which were met with great brutality in Britain and in France by the police, beating up students and so on. There was also, of course, issues among the students, as ever, as today, as they must be today. Many issues of discipline, of bad conditions, of things like that. That existed in France. France had advanced industrially quite a lot, particularly compared to pre-war. The French capitalist class, different to the British, British uh, capitalists, based themselves on backwardness for quite a long time. They didn't want to develop industry. They had colonies, of course, that was the secret. Like Britain, they had colonies. They didn't want to develop industry in France because that meant developing the French working class. They were not stupid, especially after the fright they had with the Paris Commune, where they nearly lost power in 1871. And therefore, since that time, they, they didn't want to develop it because finally they were obliged to do so. There was a big development of industry in France and all other countries. The peasantry, 
which traditionally was the basis of reaction or fascism or uh, Bonapartism in particular, was wiped out. You can't imagine this. You, you don't understand. Countries like Italy, Spain, the peasants were in the majority up until recently. It's true. Greece, they were in the majority within uh, what I can remember. They were about 60% of the population not long ago. They've been wiped out. In Britain, the peasantry, of course, doesn't, didn't exist a long time ago. In Germany, even at the time of Hitler, there was a very large peasantry. I don't know, about 30% at least. All these reserves of reaction have been whittled away, have been destroyed. And the proletariat emerged with a tremendous strength. Huge factories were built. The car industry in particular, the, the Renault factory in Flan, had 10,000 workers. And during these uh, events I'm referring to, there were uh, daily meetings of at least 1,000. And many more thousand participated in strikes, pickets, and uh, de demonstrations. Colossal power that was in the hands of the working class. What's the problem? Problem is the working class has this power and they do not know that they have this power. And the people that are supposed to be leading them, I was interested to hear the remarks of the comrade who just spoke, the trade union leaders that should be providing a lead are constantly put, pouring water over the working class, trying to, trying to prevent militancy, prevent strikes, prevent actions and so on and so forth. That goes for all countries and it was true of France in 1968. Now, it... Uh, I'll deal a little bit with my own experience later on. But let's deal with this question of the student to vote. There was, there were serious issues. I mean, there were issues of severe overcrowding, bad facilities, other things, even the terrible questions of not being allowed into female dormitories. That's really something. There were all these, if you like, there was a disciplinary question because there was severe uh, repression taking place in the universities. And therefore, of course, the discontent erupted in a series of... Now, let's ask ourselves the question, what is the role of, of students in society? Can students carry through the socialist revolution on their own? No, they cannot. They don't have the power, they don't have the strength. Student strikes, well, you can have a student strike, you can strike as long as you like. What difference does it make to the employers or the government? Not very much, it's like a demonstration. And eventually you get tired of that, then they drift back to, uh, back to their studies, and that will be the end of it. With the working class, as you saw in France, it's entirely different. What is true of students is that, and they can play a very important role, I don't wish to uh, contradict that, students can, and they did play an important role in, in France, but it's more as a barometer. The students and intellectuals are a sensitive barometer of the tensions that are building up in society. So if you see that there are big students moving, uh, taking place, you can be sure. That reflects, that's a, that's a sensitive barometer, and it's, a, it's like the heat lightning that occurs before a storm. That's, that would be an appropriate uh, comparison. In Nanterre in particular, which was a new university, uh, there was severe overcrowding, severe disciplinary problems, and all kinds of discontents. It erupted in March 1968 in a series of sit-ins and demonstrations and so on, which were brutally repressed. The rector of the university called in the police. The police occupied Nantes. I think it was on the 22nd of March, 1970. They called the police, and the French police are pretty, had a pretty brutal lot, especially the CRS, the thugs, the riot police, which played uh, also a significant role in these events. They, they waded in, of course, with their batons flailing left, right, and center, beating up students, arresting people, and so on. They took over Nantes. And that, if you like, was the spark the spark that lit an explosion. The, such was the mood throughout French universities. Of start, there was a, a massive movement of, pro, of solidarity, of protests, culminating in the occupation of the Sorbonne. If you know the Sorbonne, it's like Oxford or Cambridge. That is the elite university in France. The students occupied the Sorbonne, and they also were met with violence on the part of the state. And the police occupied, on the 3rd of May, the police occupied, violently occupied the Sorbonne and ejected uh, the students. And that set off a massive reaction. There were uh, riots in the streets, mass, mass, mass violent demonstrations of the students, clashes with the police, leading to many casualties, many arrests. I've got the figures here. By the way, 
Make a note of these figures if you like. I'll have to, to, to check them because my memory is not too brilliant. Let's, let's just see if, if I've got the figures handy. Have you pinched them? Because they tell a story. Ah, here we are. Here we are. Yes, May the 3rd, the police entered this one, and there were riots in the, in the Latin Quarter. That's the, the, the intellectual or student uh, artist, artist quarter it used to be. In which they were, uh, that one night there were 100 people injured, beaten up, and so on, and 500, uh, 596 arrested. They were students. 596 were, were arrested by the police. The next day, courses in the Sorbonne were suspended. But the thing didn't finish. That, that, this, this brutality, far from cowing the people, it, it made things worse. On the 6th of May, there were new battles in the Latin Quarter, this time with, with a, balance force, a balance of 422 arrests, 345 police, and 600 students were injured. So look at, look at the ratio. The first day, it's just the stu 600 students are beaten up and, and injured. The second day, uh, there's 600 students in, injured, but there's also 345 police injured. The students formed barricades, picked up cobblestones. They were still in, in Paris, there these charming old streets with cobblestones. Handy things are cobbled, about that size. Very, very handy as, as a weapon of mass destruction, you know, <laughs> for use against these police with their riot shields and their batons and their, uh, and their tear gas and so on. So that was the, that, that was the thing. And, and of course, it continued. Then, of course, we reached the culminating point. On the night of May the 10th, there was a full-scale riot all over the Latin Quarter. The rioters erected barricades, which the police assault assaulted with great violence, and so on. But then they sent in these thugs, the CRS, real and thugs, moving in like, like Roman soldiers with, with shields and batons and so on, laying into the students and so on. Yes, but these thugs, these tough guys, on the night of the 10th of May, had the shock of their lives. They weren't just met with the resistance of students armed with cobblestones, they were attacked by ordinary Parisian people, working class people, women, housewives, dropping flower pots off balconies. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Drop it. Big heavy flower pots and refrigerators and anything that came to hand, thrown at the police. So that, so that, so that on the ninth, on the, on the, on the, on the night of the tenth, let's have the figures. Out of out of the 367 people hospitalized, not injured, hospitalized, <laughs> seriously injured, out of 367 in, uh, hospitalized, 251 were police. <laughs> That's not a bad ratio, <laughs> if you know mathematics, you know. A, 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 a further 720 people were hurt and 468 arrested. Now this is serious stuff. I mean, you guys have been on student demonstrations. I think you might have had the experience of being kettled by police. Why can't the British students be like the French? <laughs> then you could teach the teach. You could you could kettle the police in that case. This is this was serious stuff. Fighting on the street, and of course it had. It began to have an effect. The general population looked at this, read the newspapers, saw these reports of police brutality, and of course the people were, were shocked, profoundly shocked. And that shock, of course, extended to the working class, to the trade unions, to the factories, and so on and so forth. People said, well, we can't have this. This is uh, not, good, not good enough. What was the role of the leaders, the trade union leaders, and particularly the leaders of the French Communist Party? The French Communist Party at this stage was the, the main workers' party in Spain. It controlled a big union called the CGT. Still, it still, did I say Spain? France. <laughs> my heart is in Spain, as you know. <laughs> but tonight my head has got to be in France, so I better, better go back to Paris. It's, it, 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 the, the, the CGT was the biggest trade union in Spain. It was controlled by the Communist Party. <laughs> did I say the same thing again? <laughs> I think I'm getting old. Somebody else can take over. <laughs> the biggest trade union in France there, I got it out. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> Finalement. <laughs> I got it out. The biggest, uh, the biggest party, uh, the biggest trade union in France were controlled by the communists. What was their attitude? What did they have to say about it? Nothing. Oh, not, not quite nothing. 
they said these were adventures, irresponsible adventures organized by petty bourgeois pseudo-revolutionaries who should be ignored, should not be supported. This was the, that was the line. That's what you could read in the communist newspaper, L'Humanité. An absolute uh, blatant betrayal of elementary, if you're not, not socialist, of elementary democratic uh, principles. Yes, but that did not reflect the mood of the rank and file. That was not the attitude of the ordinary workers in the factories, or in the, brand, the, the Communist Party workers, or the workers in the CGD. They were scandalized, outraged, and therefore they put colossal pressure on the leaders. And of course, you know, you know where the trade union leaders stand. They stand where they're pushed, always, and they were under severe pressure, and therefore they responded as they should have res responded from the beginning, by calling a general strike, a one-day general strike, for May the 11th, it was called by all the main unions, not just the, C not just the CGT, but the CFTT. That's interesting. CFTT was the second union which grew rapidly during the strike. This had been, up until recently, a Catholic trade union. Oh, yes. An anti-communist trade union controlled by the church. You see how things can change. When the, when the class begins to move all things, you can have all kinds of strange changes taking place. And the CFTT actually it was to the left of the CGT. They, in a confused way, they put forward the argument of workers' control, autogestion, they used to call it self-management in French and so on. But there's this general strike. And therefore, this was accompanied by a mass demonstration, huge demonstration, of the CGT, the CFTT, and the FEN, the FEN, which is the main, main uh, student union, the official is, is, is student union, if you like. They call for a general strike, and they call for a general strike on the 13th of May, where there was a huge turnout, a huge turnout. The streets of France. The first uh, strike was accompanied by, uh, was, uh, I think it was a demonstration of, of 200,000, I think. The second strike would have been mu much bigger than that. With your permission, I don't have a lot of time, but I must quote an eyewitness account published at the time, said the following. Endlessly they filed past. Every factory, every major workplace seemed to be represented. There were numerous groups of railwaymen, postmen, printers, metro personnel, metal workers, airport workers, market men, electricians, lawyers, sewer men, bank employees, building workers, glass and chemical workers, waiters, municipal employees, printers, Painters and decorators, gas workers, shop girls, insurance clerks, road sweepers. I could continue. There's more. In other words, the whole of the working class was moving into action, layer after layer. Even workers that had been sectors that had been inert for years, uh, that weren't unionized. Let me just give you one astonishing figure. One astonishing figure. I said this was the biggest general, revolutionary general strike in history. Do you know how many trade union members there were in France at that time? 3.5 million. That's all. Very small. The, 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 the French have never been very good at uh, organization. Mar Marx and Engels commented on that. Compared to the British or the Germans or the Belgians, the French were a bit more. 3.5 million workers in unions. 10 million workers occupied the factories at the height of the strike. Astonishing. Whole factories became organized, like the Citroën plant, the gigantic Citroën car factory, where there was a regime of terror. Incidentally, I should make the point. You see these clever guys who, who couldn't see any, any sign of a movement of the working class. They, they were ignorant of the real position of the workers in the fact. They didn't know, as they don't know now in Britain. They don't know any, they've got no contact with the workers. They have no understanding of the real serious problems that workers face. It's true that uh, industry had grown, that the economy was booming, bosses were making a lot of profits, yes, but that wasn't reflected in the general increase in living standards. Some workers uh, improved their position, but many workers, especially the young workers, did not. There was a lot of discontent, a lot of uh, tyranny in the factories. The Citroën is a case in point. There were no trade unions allowed in Citroën, this gigantic car factory. The bosses had armed guards stationed all over the factory to, co to control the workers, to make dis discipline. Most of the workers in that factory, by the way, were not uh, born French citizens. They were mainly immigrants from North Africa, from Spain, from Portugal, from uh, Yugoslavia, from all over. 
back with oppressed immigrant workers under the heel of the bosses. The Citron factory became organized in 24 hours. They jo all joined the union. I think it might have been the CFDT or the CGT or both. I'm not quite sure. It doesn't matter. Tremendous mo movement of the workers. The workers understood the need for unity, the need for organization, and by God, they got organized. F uh, amazingly. Yes, of course, but the, the, the trade union leaders called this general strike, one day general strike, one day note general strike, reluctantly dragging their heels, cursing under their breath. The trade union bureaucrats generally, they don't like to be bothered, they don't like to do very much. And therefore, they, they were forced to do this. And they did this, they called this strike with a, with a clear intention of allowing the workers, allowing the people to blow off steam. Oh yes, we'll have a nice one day strike and a nice uh, little demonstration, big demonstration. People will shout, shout their lungs out and they get tired and they'll go home satisfied and that'll be the end of the matter. Big miscalculation. Tremendous big mi mi miscalculation. That one day strike and that demonstration, it was like a huge rock, a huge boulder dropped into a, a, a lake, a calm, tranquil lake. It, dropped into the waters and it caused waves, like wildfire. The revolutionary mood, because that's what it was, spread all over France, instantly, immediately. Factory after factory after factory came out on strike the next day. They couldn't hold it. They couldn't hold it. And therefore, like a gigantic snowball, the general strike began to gather strength. The, 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 the scope of it is absolutely incredible. Let me see if I... I've got some other stuff here. Oh, yes, there we have said that already. Yes. Yes, there, there, there was the, the Citroën workers I've mentioned, particularly on May the 14th, the huge uh, air, air, air building factories, the uh, Sud, Avia, uh, Sud Aviation in Nantes. The workers just didn't just strike, they occupied the factories. The occupations began. The workers began to occupy the factories spontaneously. Nobody asked them to do that. The trade union leaders were against it, but they did it anyway. They occupied the factories. The uh, Renault factory at, 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 at uh, Cléon, followed by the Renault workers at Flan, Le Mans, and uh, boulogne billancourt which I'll mention that factory later on. On May the 18th, the coal miners came out. The gas workers, the electricity workers. The workers took control of uh, petrol supplies in Nantes, refusing entry to all petrol tankers which did not carry authorization from the strike committee. Workers control. They even controlled, uh, they appe appealed to the, to, the to the peasants. Very important, they appealed to, there's a smaller peasantry than in the past, but it's still important. They appealed to the peasants. Peasants being robbed and, f and, and, and cheated of the, uh, their products. The workers said, well look, you give us food, we will distribute it to the population at a fair price. We will agree with you. We'll cut out the middlemen. We'll agree with the person what, how much uh, you want for your product, and we'll sell this product at that price. And this was done with the result. There's an example here I've got somewhere. Yes. A litre of milk was sold for 50 centimes compared to the normal 80. That's not bad. You know, in other words, with workers' control, we're cutting out the, the capitalists, selling direct to the, the public, you could even have a considerable reduction of price, uh, prices and give the, the, the peasants a far better, uh, better deal. The students, of course, teachers. Uh, near where I was staying, I was staying at, at that time. I went to, I, well, perhaps I should say a bit about that. At the time, I was uh, a member of what was then called the Militant Tendency, a Marxist organization. And uh, I was in Sussex University. We decided that we should say, we, we weren't a very large organization at that stage, we didn't have many resources, but we were always internationalists, and therefore we understood that the significance of these events for Britain and the whole of Europe. So it was decided that it was, they would send me to France, I could speak French, better French then than, than now, but I could speak French. I went with a Scottish comrade in a battered old car. He didn't. I hesitated to make, I hesitated to make remarks about uh, Scottish people and money, <laughs> Mainly because I, I've never in my life met a mean Scotsman. Well, only once, only once, that's too bad. That's another story. <laughs> S Scottish people are very generous people. It's entirely false what, the, what they say. But this comrade anyway, perhaps because he didn't have much money, he didn't fill the, the tank up. Of course, it didn't occur to him or me 
that in a general strike, it's a bit difficult to get hold of petrol. <laughs> and therefore, I don't know how we did this, and therefore, with, with our hearts, hearts in our mouths, we were, were struggling along from, uh, from Calais to Paris, uh, looking for a petrol station. They were all closed, of course. Along the road, every, you could see every factory had red flags fluttering in the, in the breeze. Over every factory, there were red flags. And where there were petrol stations, there were gigantic queues. Finally, we queued up, and eventually we managed to get some petrol, and we finally staggered into, into Paris. What did we find? Well, look, actually, in my, in, during my life, I was counting it this morning, on four occasions I've had, I've had uh, the possibility of participating or, 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 or observing at close quarters a revolution. And they all have the same features. And this, you better believe it, this was a revolution. It wasn't just a, a strike, it was a revolution. You arrived in Paris, you could breathe it. The atmosphere was electric. Never seen anything like it before. I, I, I saw it subsequently a number of times, but I've never seen it before. Everyone, on, on every street corner, there were groups of people arguing heatedly about politics and what's happening. What's happening in the strike? What's the meaning of this? Where are we going? What's the goal going? Huh? They would be, uh, on every, every wall was plastered with posters, with uh, revolutionary uh, manifestos, and people would, uh, often written by hand, badly written, but there'd be groups of people gathering around and reading this avidly. What does this group say? What does that group say? What does this party say? The atmosphere was, was buzzing, it was electric. And every single layer, you wouldn't believe this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna quote some incredible examples now. Every single layer was involved in this movement. Near where I was staying in the uh, Latin Quarter, we passed, we were walking along, we passed a labor exchange, you know. Was was, the, they were not supposed to be organized in trade unions. The labor exchange was plastered with trade union po posters of the CFTT, as it happens. And then, uh, some distance away, some scientists had occupied the observatory, astronomers had occupied the observatory. Oh yes, and that isn't the most extraordinary thing. Let me see. Where are we now? Oh yes, that the footballers uh, occupied the football ground. You know, I'm not normally friendly to footballers, but there we are. Footballers occupied the, and they ho hoisted the red flag over the football ground. Imagine that happening in West Ham. I know. <laughs> I changed my attitude towards football drastically. Even the girls in the Folie Berger, you know, the Can Can dancers, they went on strike. Everything. Uh, this this was uh, precisely what a revolution precisely is. What are the other, I must look at this. Oh yes, you see, the Communist Party, I'll come back to the people involved in a moment. The Communist Party leaders and the leaders of the CGT, their sole interest in all of this was to put the brakes on, to limit the strike. They argued that it was, oh yes, it's, just, it's, just, it's like an ordinary strike. It was not an ordinary strike, my friends. A general strike is not an ordinary strike. Why? Because a general strike poses the question of power. Think about it. Think of those workers distributing petrol and say, you can, you, it doesn't matter if you're a government, government minister, if you, if you ain't got a, a chit from the strike committee, you don't get any petrol. And the question that arises is this. Who controls? Who's boss? Who's master of the house? Is it the government? Is it de Gaulle? By the way, President de Gaulle, if you didn't know, was supposed to be a strong man, Bonapartist, uh, authoritarian type. Oh yes, but who runs society? And that question has to, that's the question that must be resolved by a general strike. Either the workers will take power into their own hands, and that was possible, by the way. We actually uh, took a leaflet across, in, uh, which we distributed as, as much as possible putting our program forward, and our program was this. What is needed in France is to, because they were, uh, they'd occupied, 10 million workers occupied the factories, they controlled the factories, they had committees and so on and so forth. What should have been done? Simple. Link up the committees. <coughs> Link up the committees on a local basis, on a, on a city-wide basis, on a district basis, and elect a general committee of the strike, ele elected from below, not the bureaucracy, elected with right of recall. And the next step, of course, is that that committee, Soviet, 
Call it what you like, it doesn't matter. Should take power, say, we are the government. De Gaulle can go to hell, it represents nobody. We are the power and we will take uh, control of France from this moment. But of course, such an idea that this was very far from the mentality of the Communist Party leaders and the leaders of the CGT who had the... No, 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 this is only for demands of higher wages and pensions and so on and so forth. And, uh, and by the way, you mustn't have a general movement. It must be negotiated on a factory by factory basis. In other words, to, to, to split the movement up, to weaken it, to destroy it. That was what they were uh, up to. But of course, this is, uh, this of course was not possible. Now, just in a, a PS, by the way, to show you the uh, bankruptcy of sectarianism, of ultra-left sectarianism, which is a common feature of the university. It was very difficult. We tried, we tried to contact the workers in the factories, but it was virtually impossible because the bureaucrats made sure that the, the factory gates were locked. Nobody was allowed into the factories because of provocateurs. Be very careful of people from the outside, dangerous people, spreading dangerous ideas and so on and so forth. It's impossible. So finally, we went along to the Sorbonne, which was occupied. That was an incredible sight. This elite university, you walk into the courtyard, huge courtyard, surrounded by statues of Louis XIV and Cardinal Richelieu, all of them with red caps, <laughs> and the pictures of Mao Zedong and Che Guevara and Leon Trotsky and, and so on and so forth, staring down at you. Incredible. And of course, all the, all the left groups had tables, like our table at the back. At that time, they were all monthly newspapers. And the newspapers had been published, of course, before the strike started, before the movement started. And I, I, I went around, I looked at every single table, with one exception, which is kind of an anarcho-syndicalist group called uh, Voix Ouvrière. All of the groups had on their front page Che Guevara, Mao Zedong, Vietnam, Bolivia, anything and everything except the French working class. That, uh, that experience to told me everything that I need to understand. These guys were completely divorced from the real situation in the factories and the real position of the workers. That's something, I, I echo what our last speaker said, very true. That's something that must never happen to us. Our student commons must find ways and means of linking directly, personally, to the workers in the factories, get to know their and of course the government uh, offices also get to know their, ex their problems, their experiences and so on at first hand. It is the only way, and support the workers by every means at our disposal. Now the question arises, I've not yet dealt with this. How did the government react? Well, the fact of the matter is it didn't. This President de Gaulle, who taken power in a coup d'etat by the way, in 1958, as a representative of the army and so on and so forth, under the slogan Algerie Francaise during the Algerian War for Independence, this strong man proved to be a straw man, a straw man, a, a nobody, a non-entity. He didn't know what to do. He was, he was demoralized. I'll prove that in a minute. I've got the quotes to prove this. He actually went, he buggered off. He went to Romania where he was welcomed with, uh, with open arms by Ceausescu, Nicola Ceausescu. I think we have a Romanian comrade here this evening. Bună ziara. See my fudge? Foarte bine. That exhausts my knowledge of Romanian. But Ceausescu was welcomed, welcomed in the, with, with open arms during this revolutionary general strike. I think that was deliberate, by the way, to try to influence the communists. Who de Gaulle saw correctly as his main point of support in France at that time. But he, he left behind this unfortunate individual, Georges Pompidou, who was the Prime Minister, who said the following, I got the quote here, the crisis was infinitely, this is his, 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 his memoirs, the crisis was infinitely more serious and more profound. The regime could stand or be overthrown. Yes, the regime could stand or be overthrown. But it could not be saved by a mere cabinet reshuffle. It was not my position, the Prime Minister, not, not my position that was in question. It was General de Gaulle, the Fifth Republic, and to a considerable extent, rep the, the, the Republican rule itself. In other words, capitalism. Capitalism was in danger of, of being overthrown. Not my words, the words of Georges Pompidou, written after the events. De Gaulle 
By the way, I said that he places confidence on the communists. You don't believe me. Let me quote this from uh, a biographer, of, a, a favorable biographer of, of, of de Gaulle. Quote, de Gaulle initially placed his confidence in the, in the, or in the, Stalinist, the Stalinist leaders to save the situation. He said to his naval aide-de-camp, uh, Francois uh, Foley, don't worry, Foley. The communists will keep them in order. This is the goal. So he, he's a shrewd member of the ruling class. He understands the role of the labor leaders rather well. Yes, but it didn't help him. By, by May the 20th, an estimated 10 million workers were on strike and the country was practically paralyzed. The government was suspended in mid -air. That was the position. De Gaulle was demoralized, there's no question about it. Here's his biographer, Charles Williams, writing uh, on the eve of, of, of de Gaulle's broadcast on May the 24th. Quote, there is no doubt that after the exhilaration of Romania, it must have been a terrible shock when he came back to Paris, the general had been badly shaken by what he found on his return to France. During the ensuing three days, he seemed to be, he seemed to, no, he seemed at last one visitor, no, he seemed at last to one visitor who had not seen him for some time to be old and indecisive. His stoop accentuated. It seemed as though it was all getting too much for him. He kept on repeating, it's a mess. Yeah. It's a mess, and he was right, he was right. As a matter of fact, we have another witness. I call, I call witness for the prosecution. The, uh, the then American ambassador, I think his name was Frank Carlucci, if my memory serves me correctly. Uh, the French ambassador, he, he called de Gaulle in, he said, well, what's going on? What's going on in France? De Gaulle replied, replied as follows. It's all up, the game's up. It's all, the game's up. In a few days' time, the communists will be in power. This is de Gaulle to the American ambassador. And therefore, nobody's going to tell me that the French working class could not have taken power easily like that if the leaders had so wished. But of course, they did not. Uh, they did not wish. Of course, the reformers have always got a thousand arguments, haven't they, as to why revolution is impossible. And of course, the final argument, you know what it is. Oh, if we try to take power, there'll be bloodshed. The streets running with blood, and there's the army, and there's the police force, and there's the intelligence services. Well, what can we do? We are powerless. We don't have any arms. We're powerless people. Oh, yes. Well, look, de Gaulle, on paper, had a very powerful army. Army, I think of about over over quarter of a million soldiers in France and in Germany at that time they were still in Germany a big police force the CRS and so, so on paper if you look at it on paper and you count the number of guns revolution in France was physically impossible yes the same as it was physically impossible in 1789 or in Russia in 1917 or any other uh, re revolution you care to mention in history. I'll be dealing with Oliver Cromwell tomorrow. That, that would have been impossible on paper if you, if you looked at, at this. Of course, it doesn't work like that. Because the army is made up, the police also, but above all, the army is made up of ordinary working class kids who were also affected, particularly in France at that time, because they were conscripts not professional soldiers, they were called up. De Gaulle actually disappeared at this point. He took a plane, guess where he went? Not back to Romania, he went to Germany to have an interview with General Masso, who was in charge of the French soldiers, French army uh, in the Rhine. Now I was not present, unfortunately, I would have loved to be present in that discussion, but it'd be very interesting. But I know exactly what he would have said. First question would be this. Can I use the army to crush this revolt, which was, which was his intention, but initially, we know. Initially, he had a plan to arrest thousands of students and workers, uh, put them in a football stadium, the same as Pinochet did in, in, in Chile. I don't know what would happen next, but that, this plan existed, but they had to drop it. And the reason they, they couldn't use the army was explained by the Times. Now, I've got the cutting in the house, but I've left it at home. The Times newspaper in Britain sent, obviously they were concerned about France, they sent a correspondent to Germany to interview the French soldiers. And the, Fra the Times correspondent asked them, 
would you be prepared to fire on the workers in France? And they said, no. What are you talking about? My father's a worker, my brother's a worker. All right, they're a little bit rough in their, in their, in their methods, but fire, fire on the working class, no. And the Times, a very intelligent journal at that time, it's a rubbish paper now, but it was quite good. <laughs> Never been the same since they, they, put adver they took the advertisements off the front page. Well, that's the, matter. Uh, the Times was an intelligent bourgeois paper at that time. And you know what they said in an editorial? They, they actually put the question, can de Gaulle use the army? And they answered, de Gaulle could perhaps use the army once. Once. That means one bloody clash between the army and the working class, and that would have been it. That would have been it. The fat would be on the fire. They'd lose control of the army. They'd lose control of France. They would lose control of everything. Therefore, they could not use the army. That's the, the, the fact of the matter. Therefore, the state itself was in, in, in crisis. The Times also said, 31st of May, that the, the police were seething with discontent, quote, unquote. And by the way, here's a leaflet, I have it in front of me, a leaflet which was published at the time by the mechanized infant, a, a mechanized infantry regiment stationed near S S Strasbourg in France, said the following. Like all conscripts, we are confined to barracks. That's what they didn't trust them. They locked them up. They didn't unleash them on the public. They locked them inside the barracks for fear that they'd fraternize and go over with their guns. Like all conscripts, we are confined to barracks. We are being, we are being prepared to intervene to, to, as, re, as repressive forces. The workers and youth must know that the soldiers of this, of the, of this contingent will never fire on workers. We action committees, you see they've got action committees in the army now. We action committees are, are, are opposed at all costs to the, to the surrounding of factories by soldiers. Tomorrow the, or, or the day after, we are expected to surround an armaments factory which 300 workers who work there want to occupy. In capital letters, we shall fraternize. That's the, in capital letters. Soldiers of the contingent, form your committees. It ends up. Now, that's the, the, the red light for, for the bourgeoisie. In fact, they finished. As de Gaulle said, the game's up. In a few days, the communists will be in power. And they should have been in power. And they could have been in power. And if that would have been the case, it would have transformed Europe. But the communists persisted in treating this as an ordinary state. They sat down to negotiate in the middle of all this. To negotiate with the employers and negotiate with the governments. Wage increases, holidays, <laughs> stuff like this. At a time where the general strike had gone far beyond that far beyond demands for increased pay and so on and so forth. And the proof of that was soon to be seen. Incidentally, the journalists went on strike, the print workers went on strike, the, 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 the papers ceased to come out. Or those that came out, I tell a lie. The strike committees imposed a censorship on the press, whereby the editor, not a bad idea this, the editors had to show them any article that was published. And if they didn't like the content, it wouldn't go in, there'd be a blank space. Workers' censorship. The TV workers went on strike. The, tele the radio workers went on strike. This is absolutely uh, uh, astonishing. This, of course, is, is far beyond anything that... Uh, now, I can't find... I just, before I go to the next... I've forgotten. This is a long list. Doctors. I mean, surgeons occupied the, the doctors' uh, union offices. The architects occupied the architects' offices. The Cannes Film Fact uh, Festival, you know the Cannes, the Cannes, Cannes, I think it's pronounced, the Cannes Film, Cannes we say in, in English, the Cannes Film Fact, this, uh, with all, the, all the, the vedettes and the film stars and all the rest of it, and all the, uh, they went on strike. And uh, the, the strike committee eventually uh, ended the festival. It, 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 it was finished. It, so that, I mean, that means every single, Incidentally, incredibly, even some of the capitalists went on some factory, I don't know why, some factory directors occupied the Employers Association. I'll, ne I'll never know to my dying day why they did that. Perhaps they thought it was the fashion, I don't know. <laughs> but what I'm saying, this, this, what, this is not an ordinary strike, this is a revolution. It reminds me, you know, the, 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 great, Fre the great French Revolution of 1789, when the, the masses turned up at Versailles 
The women led, led, led this. They turned up with the pikes and, and so on and so forth. And the, the king's uh, lackey said, uh, terrified, came to see the king, said, uh, explain what was done. The king said, Mais c'est une revolte. He said, but, but this is a rebellion. Said, non, sir, c'est une revolution. No, sire, it's a revolution. And this is this, this if, look, if this was not a revolution, I think we will never live to see a revolution in, in our lives. It was, but of course, they, they, they didn't take the action, the leadership didn't take the action that they could and ought to have taken. Now, I was in Paris. Of course, I didn't arrive at the beginning of these events. But I arrived towards, the, towards the, the latter part. And of course, a situation like this, by its very nature, cannot last. Marx, or was Marx or Engels, one of the two once said, there are periods in history in which 10 years can pass as one day. And then if 10 years passes, nothing much happens. That was the case in France before that. He said, nothing much was happening, apparently. He said, there are other days in which the history of 10 years can be summed up in 24 hours. That was the case in France. A revolutionary situation by its very nature cannot be maintained indefinitely. There's some analogies even with an ordinary strike. At the beginning of any ordinary strike, at the beginning, the workers are enthusiastic, they attend the meetings, they attend the picket lines, they make sacrifices and so on. Yes, but if this strike is allowed to drag on too long, without any end in sight, then the workers will get tired, beginning with the, the weaker elements, the more backward elements, they will drift back to work and so on and so forth, and the strike will be lost. Something similar is the case in a general strike also. The, the strike, this is three weeks of strike and, not, and nothing was happening. Except that the trade union leaders were beginning to negotiate a sellout. Now I was present, uh, <laughs> there was one incident I remember. People were, were very distrustful of the Communist Party leaders and the bureaucrats, very, very uh, upset with them, you know. There was, I, I, was, I was standing inside a, a, a tube station and this guy comes up and he's distributing a leaflet of He's a Communist Party member. I got hold of the leaf and said, Contre tout manoeuvre, against all manoeuvres. And some guy, some worker, takes the leaf and looks at it and says, Ha! Le manoeuvre, c'est nous! <laughs> ah! Manoeuvres! We are manoeuvres! Refer, referring, <laughs> referring to the Communist Party. So there was that mood uh, existing. But I had to go into it, could, we couldn't go to the factory. So I went into a local bar, which is full of workers, looking at the television. The television cameras was inside the giant <coughs> Renault car factory at Bilancourt. It was incredible, you could see. The factory was packed from top to bottom. There were workers sitting on the gantries, on the, tra on the cranes, trying to hear what was being said. There was a report back being given by George Segi, General Secretary of the CGT. You never heard such a report in your life. He's a clever bastard, you know, real fox, typical Stalinist fox. <laughs> he didn't make any comment about his participating in these, in these negotiations, these secret negotiations, but uh, he says, okay, uh, I'll just read, read out the list of what's, what's on offer. What's on offer? 35% wage increase. That's not bad for the PCS, is it? Martin, are you there? 35%. Wage increase. Mind you, the inflation at that time was quite high, but it wasn't that high. 35, uh, pensions, holidays, anything, uh, anything you like. Anything you like. One condition, please leave the factories. Go home. Leave. And you have all these things. You know, I'll never forget this scene, although it was on television. I wasn't there, but it was as if I was there. He couldn't continue speaking. He was drowned out with a huge roar. Gouvernement populaire, gouvernement populaire. People's government, we don't want your increases. We don't want 35%, we want power. Gouvernement populaire. I don't think the man, Segi never, to the best of my knowledge, he never finished his speech. Yes, and that was the mood that exists. The workers knew they had power in their hands, that they were within that, that near to taking power. It would have been easy, and it would have been bloodless. There would have been no civil war, no blood. Of course, the Communist Party continued their betrayal. And of course, as I say, there's a limit to what the workers can put up with. And uh, by this stage, people were getting tired. Tiredness, weariness, 
disillusionment was setting in. And of course, de Gaulle, in, and that was, was, got an access of confidence and issued a radio bro television broadcast in which he announced, I'm going to dissolve the National Assembly and call new elections. You know, then he said to the communist leaders, oh, we're having elections. Why don't you forget about strikes and revolutions? Why don't you participate in a nice little election? You'll end up as ministers. You'll have jobs, of course. What more did the CP leaders want than that? Oh, and by the way, he added slyly, if you don't do this, I'll have the army in. It'll be bloodshed, it'll be civil war to frighten them. Because they didn't need any frightening, they didn't need any encouragement. That was what they were, were intending all along. And I'm uh, sorry to say, terrible tragedy, they succeeded. They succeeded. After all these superhuman efforts, <clears throat> this wonderful Elan, this wonderful revolutionary uh, struggle, ended in nothing. People drifted back to work, the workers drifted back to work, disillusioned, the students drifted back to their studies. Everything was as before, except that it wasn't as before. You see, the ruling class, it's, it's a law, you can see this. I've even got a nice little report of the first recorded strike in history of the Egyptian pyramid workers, I think it was in the Valley of Kings, and it's the same tactics, same tactics. Combination of concession and repression. When they were terrified out of their skulls by this mass movement, they offered concessions on paper. Increased wages, holidays, oh yes, they even uh, accepted, they all accepted the sacking of the Minister of Education, that was a sop to the students. Look, we got rid of this man, we got rid of, what more do you want? Everything will be fine. Concessions on paper, yes followed by repression. Repression. The moment the workers left the factory, the moment the, the students drifted back to studies, the moment the things came back to normality, they stuck the boot in. Hard. Hard. The victimization started. The sacking started. Thousands, thousands of workers were sacked. And so other people were arrested. Even, even some people were killed. In the, in the orgy of police violence that followed. The, the police reoccupied Nanta University and reoccupied the Sorbonne with violence, beating, beating up students, arresting student leaders, and so on and so forth. Black reaction. And the elections, oh, by the way, De Gaulle for, uh, called, at this moment, he called a mass demonstration of, of the right wing, of his own supporters. But I mean, that would have been nothing compared to the huge demonstrations of millions of workers that had occurred <coughs> in the previous weeks. But during the election, they mobilized reaction. The workers were demoralized, probably most of them didn't vote. And the Communist Party was rewarded, and the, and the socialists were, were rewarded by a slump in their votes. The right wing won, and de Gaulle was put back in power for a whole historical period. Now, i will finish there, but I don't wish to finish on a negative note. Because, <clears throat> to me, somebody that experienced these things firsthand, the memory of that spectacular movement will stay with me for the rest of my life. Th that was an inspiration, believe me. <clears throat> it reminded me of the words, the immortal words of the English poet, William Wordsworth, when as a young man he went to France, he experienced the revolution, and he wrote the immortal words in the prelude, Bliss was in that dawn to be alive, but to be young was very heaven. This was a genuine revolution, a magnificent revolution, which if it had succeeded, and it could have succeeded, and it should have succeeded, except for one thing, and that question is the leadership, it would have transformed the whole of Europe, never mind about France. It would have caused shockwaves throughout Europe and changed the whole of history. What conclusions do we draw? Well, you know, when a king dies, they say, the king is dead. Long live the king. I say, the French Revolution is dead. Long live the French Revolution. And long live the World Revolution, in which, drawing the necessary conclusions, the new vanguard of the youth will play the necessary role to finish this system and carry through what has to be carried through to a victorious conclusion.